But why would a girl at eight years old make such a dua unless she's been taught? So the teaching has to come. And it shouldn't be in a way that it's forced. It needs to be organic, natural. That's very important. MashaAllah, we do have families that are very strict. So nothing can be wrong. And they get bashed and told, told off and everything like that. That doesn't usually work. There has to be a softness because Allahu Akbar. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi as Allah mentions in the Quran about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his Sahaba, his Sahaba are like his children, right? In kunta fadhan ghalid al qalbi lan fadu min haulik. If you were harsh, if you were harsh and rough with them, they would have run away from you. That's te- the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knows that, but Allah is telling the whole ummah, telling everybody that that it needs to be taught with love consideration, practicality, and functionalism. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Was salatu was salamu ala al mabruthi rahmatan lil alameen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa salama tasliman kathiran ila yomidin amma bad. قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا صدق الله العظيم. So dear brothers, uh, we are going to spend some hours of this, uh, well, um, uh, some time on this very precious Saturday when uh, you could be doing uh, so much. Uh, Lester has so much to offer on a Saturday evening, I guess, and there's a lot of competition to sitting in a masjid. But mashallah, you have uh, preferred to sit in this masjid. So I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I don't waste your time. Because it's very precious time. You could be going out, you could be eating, you could be, I don't know, watching a football match. I don't know if football is on, I have no idea. So you could be doing a lot of stuff. But we're sitting here in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this beautiful Dar al Arqam, um, which gives you an idea that there's a lot of good things to come. Dar al Arqam is only the beginning. Because right. that's how it started in Medina Munawwara. It started uh, in Makkah Mukarramah, Darul Arqam. And then it became, mashallah, to where we have it in Leicester. So Darul Arqam is just the beginning. It's not the end. There's a lot more to do, inshallah. So, what we were speaking about is youth. Now, it's very, very, very difficult to speak about youth when you've got our older folk here. And then we've got our middle-aged, and then we have our young adults, and then we have children. How do you speak to such a cross-segment of society of four different levels and not put somebody to sleep? So either the children are going to go to sleep, the older people are going to everybody's going to go to sleep. It's very difficult. And my problem is that I can't leave anybody behind. I can't ignore anybody. So you've just made my life very easy. Why did the children even come? It's a youth program. Alhamdulillah. So anyway, Allah Ta'ala help us. Allah help us. It's, uh, it's always complicated. So let's pick a few children here. Uh, what the one with the glasses. What's your name? Black hat. Sorry? You are Hassan. And who's next to you? The, what's your name? Hussein. You're Hussein. Hassan and Hussein. And are you Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya? <laughs> uh, what's your name? Hamza. You're Hamza. So Hassan, Hussein, and Hamza. You guys are going to have to understand what I say. And anything you don't understand, you have to put your hand up. Okay? Because if you understand everything, then everybody understands. And if you don't understand, then nobody understands. Okay, so do you understand everything I said so far? Okay, so then put your hand up if you don't understand anything. Okay? So, alhamdulillah, when it comes to youth, there's... Uh, quite a few things that we want to discuss right now. Some things may be irrelevant to the children, but um, Allah Ta'ala give us strength to understand this properly and to discuss this properly. We have guidance in terms of how to bring up children and how to be as children and as youth and as adults from our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has given us a deen, a religion which is what we call totalizing. Our faith is totalizing. You can't be in Islam half and half. Udkhulu fi silmi kafa. Enter Islam 
fully and wholly. Otherwise, we're going to be deficient when we get to afterlife and we're going to be deficient in this world. Islam is, provides guidance in everything. That's why it's a totalizing religion. That's why whenever you try to go and if somebody says, what is Islam to you? A lot of people reduce Islam down to five pillars. Islam is based on five pillars. Yes, it is. But that is just one aspect of Islam. When we speak about Islam being based on five pillars, kalima, shahad, you know, ashad wa la ilaha illallah and salat, zakat, hajj, all of these things, somebody who is really thoughtful, he's going to listen to this and think, is your, is your religion just about worship to a God and nothing else? What about your interaction with others? What about environment? What about animal rights? What about your neighbors? What about your dealings? So the five pillars that we have, they're just part of one dimension of Islam. We have five dimensions of Islam, all the way from the belief dimension of what we should believe. What is the purpose of this world? Where did we come from? Where are we going? What should we be doing? Is there a God? Who is this God? What, what, what is he? What, what, what are his characteristics? Why are prophets sent? All of that. That's called aqidah and belief. Then we have, once you've understood a God, who he is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then how do we worship him? That's where the five pillars come in. The five pillars are part of the second dimension of how you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's our responsibilities? Then after that, we are human beings, so we deal with one another every day, all the time, right? We can't live in isolation. We deal with people on two levels. One is on a contractual level, like a buying, selling, renting, marriage. Those are contracts. But then we also have other, uh, other dealings with people on a social interaction of just being nice to one another, being um, uh, respecting your elderly and honoring uh, and being compassionate to your young and being good to your neighbor and animals and so on and so forth. Those are the third and fourth dimensions. And then what's left? Isn't that everything? Well, there's a fifth dimension, which is to sort our inside out. So that all of these other dimensions, they stay right. That's called ihsan, purification. If our heart is right, then our worship will be correct. Our understanding will be right. Our dealings will be better. But if our, underst- our inner heart is uh, corrupt and problematic, then all of this will be corrupt as well. So it's a beautiful system, alhamdulillah. And we need to be bringing up our children and ensuring that all five of these are correct. Otherwise... It's lopsided. It's deficient. But the only way these five things can be correct is if we get it. Uh, after being a, a father of four children and, you know, the oldest one being 25 years old or, you know, and so on, I think that gives you some understanding. You know, you, the, we, we get an understanding of mistakes we've made. A lot of people make, make mistakes with the first or second child and then, they learn by trial and error. So by the time it's the second or third child, then we've hopefully learned. If somebody still makes the same mistake on the third or fourth child, then they haven't learned anything. We, you know, what we want to do is we actually want to encourage people not to make mistakes, to be correct from the first child. Because sometimes we could actually scar the first or second child beyond repair sometimes. And then we're much better to the third and fourth child, for example. So we don't want to make those mistakes. Why is parenting becoming more confusing and more complicated now? Why is it? Because before people lived in very, uh, in very close-knit societies where the extended family uh, were all together, used to all live together, and they usually had the same ethics. They shared the same ethics. Right, So if you go to certain villages, for example, in India or Pakistan or whatever, one particular family where they all lived, they were usually quite consistent in what they all agreed with or what their mannerisms were and what their culture was. There would be slight variances, not the kind of variance that we see today. So number one, we live in communities now where very few people actually live with all of their relatives around them. It's just not possible anymore. You just don't have that kind of land mass or the property or the ability to pay for that kind of thing where everybody's living in this enclosure of all the brothers and all their 15 children all together. You know, it, it, it just doesn't work that way. We have people from different cultures, 
and people from different religions. And that just creates a much more confusing idea. That's why people, uh, th there's parents who want their children to marry somebody from their own culture or their relative, and the children don't want to. Why don't they want to? For multiple reasons. Number one, the parent and the child did not, uh, they did not get onto the same wavelength from a young age so that the parent could understand their own child and the culture they're living in. And the child understand where the parent is coming from because there's no communication. It's just maybe orders or instruction and no communication. And complete ignorance of modern society, for example, or old society for the younger people. So then what happens is, when they become 23, and the time comes to marriage, for example, you have to marry your cousin. What do you mean I have to marry my cousin? I'm interested in somebody else. Oh, I don't want to marry my cousin. But I promise you to your uncle when you were two years old. Seriously, this is some cultures. Some cultures are like that. They've been promised already. And then it's a battle. If you wanted that, go and stay in the village where that works. And everybody's brought up to think that way. Then it's fine. But you come somewhere else, then it's very difficult. Because like, look at me now, right? My parents are from Gujarat in India. But what is Gujarati about me? I mean, what I'm wearing, this, this inner jubba is Saudi. Probably made in China. Um, this outside one is made in Jordan, it's Moroccan. My, my hat is Turkish. My turban, I'm not sure what style it is. But the cloth is from Pakistan. My watch is Japanese and my phone is Korean, I think. This is Pakistani and my socks are American, I think. I mean, what, what is Gujarati about me now? I'm still Gujarati. I still like my Gujarati food, right? I still enjoy that. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not a hater of culture. Culture is very important. None, nobody can... Uh, I, don't, I don't think that anybody's done a proper study on this, but I'll tell you something. Nobody can avoid culture. There's a lot of people they're from a Pakistani background or Gujarati or Memon or Somali or whatever, and they don't like being that. I don't like culture. Okay, you don't like culture. You just don't like your culture. You're going to have to have a culture. Everybody has a culture. Humans always have culture. You have to remember that. It's just going to be a new culture. You get guys, they say, I don't want to marry anybody from you know, this background. I said, why not? He said, they come with baggage. Okay, cool. Who do you want to marry? I want to marry a convert. Converts also come with baggage. It's just a different baggage. And just because you don't know about it, you think it's better baggage than your baggage. Right? Allahu Akbar. It's confusing. A lot of people are confusing. You cannot divorce yourself of culture. Just remember, it's a very important point. You can't divorce yourself of culture. Uh, most people here look like either, you know, uh, from immigrant families, right? Um, I don't see any Anglo-Saxon, original Anglo-Saxon people here, right? And if there, even if there is, that doesn't make a difference. What I'm trying to say is that when you come here, every Muslim culture that we come from, whether that's the Punjabi culture, Gujarati culture, Somali culture, Egyptian culture, whatever it is, it's, there's a Muslimness to it. So it's, it's Islamic. But there's also bad things which have crept into everyone's culture. Our job is to weed out the bad stuff from our culture and only keep the good culture and adopt any other good. We, uh, Allah, I mean, you can see this as an opportunity that I live among Pakistanis and Somalis and Algerians and Moroccans and Turks. I can take the best of their culture. So I can have, more, I have Moroccan soup at home and Moroccan tagine, along with the Gujarati food and, uh, you know, the hummus, you know, from, uh, from Syria or Lebanon and, and so on. It's completely fine. The good aspects of all culture can be taken. There's nothing wrong with that. What governs what is good or bad is Islam. Is it Islamically sanctioned? Would the Prophet ﷺ allow this? The Prophet ﷺ did not come down with a new culture, like a brand new culture. Let's just be totally different. We'll dress completely different. No. He took the best of the local culture, 
meaning he carried on with the local culture, whatever it was, and just took out all of the bad culture. Right? So keep that in mind. It says, what is your culture? Is it pure Gujarati? Is it pure Merman? It is not. Because when you guys go back to whichever country you or your parents came from, you frown at certain things that your extended de- relatives there do. You don't even agree with it because it's different. Some of you even think that you're more il- uh, enlightened because you live in England. Because you've got part of British culture. Right? So keep that in mind. It's a, this is a very sensitive but very important topic to understand. What is your culture? Our culture needs to be Islamic. And what is Islamic? Islamic culture is anything good that doesn't contravene any that doesn't violate any Islamic principles and that helps to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is really, really much. So now that we got that out of the way, it is very confusing because we don't have extended family all bringing our children up. Because before, our children would be brought up by the community and everybody kind of was on the same page. The really evil people, they were kind of shunned anyway. So you didn't want your children speaking to them. But now you can't. You, you, if, you lock your, if you lock your children at home and you don't want them to go out, you, they still can't be safe. Because they're going to have some gadgets. How can, you, how can your child not have any gadgets? Even if they don't want any, the children, once they go to a certain school, they'll, they, they, my kid went to one school and gave them iPads that in your college, that, you know, uh, that's where you do your work. It, it's just become much more complicated. So, okay, so I'm not lamenting the fact that it's just more complicated. What do we do about it? So our responsibility has just grown. That's what it is. You want to bring your children up in the modern age, especially in the UK and Western countries. Alhamdulillah, in the UK, it's still a lot better than a lot of other places, I'll tell you that. After experience, I'm telling you. Because we've got a lot more infrastructure, a lot more Islamic infrastructure. The amount of maktabs and madrasa and classes for men, women and children that are going on in England in a place like Leicester, right, is much more than what's going on in Austria, in France, and uh, Germany and all of these other countries put together, even in America. In America, more than 50% of the masjids don't have proper imams, like an official imam. Anybody who can read well or, you know, uh, he, he, he leads the prayer, everybody's a mufti in town. Alhamdulillah. But it's still difficult because we've got so many things to worry about. We've got so many things to be confused about. So there's so much pressure, so much influences and the only way to sort this out is that we become more God conscious, Allah conscious. That uh, I've been thinking of this for a very long time. The only way, the, mo- not the, the most successful way and easiest way to get our children to be on the right path is if we become more God conscious and balanced like the Prophet ﷺ was. Then the job will be done. I'll give you an example. If we can just understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and our children begin to understand that and they become directly accountable to Allah and not us anymore, then your life is going to improve. For example, let's just say there was a guy, uh, a kid who just went to, started high school academy, you know, uh, 11, 12 years old, comes back in two, three days, uh, you know, uh, the second or third day. His mom asked him, did you pray dhuhr at school? It's not a Muslim school, it's just regular uh, academy. It's winter time when Dhuhr, you know, you'll miss it. He said, no. Now tell me, I, I want some interaction. W- should you be happy with that or should you be sad? The guy didn't pray. He said, no, I didn't pray. Should you be happy or sad? So let's start off with those who are sad about the fact. Uh, put your hand up. That's about, okay. Who was happy? Who would be happy? Oh, you guys are happy that he didn't pray? You're happy? Allahu Akbar, mashallah. And the rest of you who didn't answer, are you like happy, sad, what are you? Or you're not sure what to think. I, when I heard it, I was very happy. He didn't say like, no, I didn't pray. I'm not going to pray. He didn't say it that way. He said, no, I didn't pray. Okay, why didn't you pray? I just couldn't find a place to pray, you know. I, I, I couldn't find a place to pray and he's still getting his grounding. He's not bold enough to ask. So his mom spoke to him. And said, why don't you speak to a, a nice teacher that, you know, especially one, you're going past and you see that her room is empty or the teacher's room is, you know, the, the classroom is empty. He's going to speak, look, I'm going to take five minutes. Can I just quickly make my prayer here, please? You know, 
So Alhamdulillah, after a few days, he sorted it out. Now he prays in school. If this interaction wasn't there, how would he do it? If the mum or father didn't have this practical approach, he said, why didn't you pray? You can't do it because sometimes they just can't. There's a reason for it. There has to be that practical interaction and discourse. Very important. Now, one of the things that children don't like to do uh, or, uh, is that the, uh, what do you call those? Those uh, wash basins, they're very dirty. Everybody's using them. They don't clean them so well. And then getting caught with your foot in the sink when you're doing wudu. So I know a family in which all of their children, when they've gone to school, they've had wudu socks. A normal pair of socks cost how much? How much is one pair of normal socks? How much? Two About two pounds. That's a good pair of socks, right? One to do, if you go to Primark, you might get it cheaper. Two pounds or so. How much does a wudu socks cost? Ten. Pounds. ten. Where'd you get them for ten pounds? <laughs> I've never seen them ten pounds anywhere. The cheapest I find like fourteen, sixteen pounds, right? They're about between fourteen to twenty-two pounds, right? But all of their children, they've actually invested wudu socks. So it just makes life easy for them. You're going to have to work with our children. This is the challenge we have. This is the challenge that we have out there. So God consciousness. So why did that child decide to tell the truth and say, I didn't pray? Because he knew that he's not going to be bashed by the ultra strict ones. And uh, he's more conscious of Allah than his parents. He knows that his parents, is not, I'm not praying for my parents. It's like genuinely like, I couldn't pray. His consciousness is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I need help with this. Right? He knows that his parents are going to give him a solution or at least help, help him. So that's why he brings it up to the children. Uh, brings it up to the parents. Otherwise, he could have easily said, I prayed. How easy would that, would that have been? And are you going to really call up the school and say, did my son pray? They'll probably report you to prevent if you did that. <laughs> you know, it's like these guys are extremists. Allahu Akbar. We have to become more aware of this. Uh, another quick incident. There's a girl who's eight years old, approximately. Eight, seven, eight years old. Her brother is two years older than her. Had to go to opticians and he discovered that he needed glasses. So when the little sister found out, she started making fun of him. You're going to need glasses. The mum who wears glasses said to the child that, you know what? said to the daughter, don't make fun of him because your dad wears glasses, your mom wears glasses, your older brother has glasses, you're going to have glasses as well. It runs in the family, I guess. Right? So you're going to get glasses as well, right? Logical conclusion. So don't make fun of him. Now fast forward 10 years, she's 17, 18 years old, and she's got younger siblings as well, and they also have glasses. So the father, mother, older brother, younger ones have glasses, but she doesn't. Hamza, why doesn't she have glasses? Why does everybody have glasses and she doesn't have? Is that because she's a girl and it's discriminating? Why doesn't she have glasses? Tell me, can you answer that riddle? Hmm? Why doesn't she have glasses? I'll tell you why. How old are you? You're 12, right? So you're four years older than when she was before, right? So she later tells us, 10 years later she told you know, the, the parents, she remarked that, you know, mom, when you told me that I should, um, I'm going to get glasses as well, when I was eight years old, I started praying to Allah subhanahu wa doing dua to him, that, Ya Allah, I don't want glasses. She doesn't have glasses. Now, the parent didn't say when she was seven that, look, pray to Allah that you don't get glasses. She should have done that, but she didn't. She just said, don't make fun of your brother. But then still, where did the girl learn to? Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask him and make him dua for. Obviously, they taught her that before. That Allah works. Allah is there to help you. Now, if your dua has been accepted like that, how are you going to feel about Islam? Power, you see that? That's ma'rifa. It's worked for you. But why would a girl at eight years old make such a dua unless she's been taught? So the teaching has to come. And it shouldn't be in a way that it's forced. It needs to be organic, natural. That's very important. MashaAllah, we do have families that are very strict. So nothing can be wrong. And they get bashed and told, told off and everything like that. That doesn't usually work. There has to be a softness because 
Allahu Akbar. The Prophet ﷺ's tarbiyah, as Allah mentions in the Quran about the Prophet ﷺ and his sahaba, his sahaba are like his children, right? In kunta fadhun ghalid al qalbi lan fadhu min haulik. If you were harsh, if you were harsh and rough with them, they would have run away from you. That's te- the Prophet ﷺ knows that, but Allah is telling the whole ummah, telling everybody that that. It needs to be taught with love, consideration, practicality, and functionalism. Not just bang, bang, bang. There's a guy that I know right now. He's 25 years old, maybe. And he's had major waswasa problems. OCD. Spending so much time doing wudu. And then when that goes away, then it's, is my nikah valid or not? And then... um, Am I still a Muslim or not because I thought of this? It's just this, Allah, Allah protect because that's a really bad place to be. You know, all of these whispers, all of these doubts in the mind. And, and then he tells me one day, I, I've been work, I'd been working with him, and then he tells me one day, I think the reason I've got it is because my dad was just so strict about everything. Don't drop this. If that drop, I'd be, I don't know what, I don't know what his dad did to him. But basically he's saying that he was just overly strict on... Uh, little, you know, little mess ups and things like that. I guess the dad didn't uh, want to do tarbiyah, had all good intention, but just didn't understand it as just a bit taking a sledgehammer instead of a, you know, a little tap. Uh, I'm not saying beat up them, but, you know, it's just over the top. So he reckons that his thing, his feelings are because of that. Allah knows best. I don't know. You understand? So. Overly being strict is not the way to do tarbiyah. That's not the way the Prophet Now, we, how do we know what kind of tarbiyah the Prophet did? The Prophet sons uh, did not survive beyond the, in, uh, be, beyond the childhood stage, right? Qasim and Tayyib, Tahir, Ibrahim. They all died, radiallahu anhum. They all died in their young age. So we don't know how the Prophet brought up sons, right? But he brought up the sons of the Ummah. We know that. And he brought up his daughters. And none of them got messed up. And he wasn't over the top. He would play with them. He would let him... And I'm not here to say that, you know, you're, you're, you're so languid about this that, you know, they're just jumping all over. You have no sense of, you know, you have actually no sense of strictness or you have no sense of position or anything like that. It's not what we're saying. But ultimately, that's very important to have that kind of approach. It needs to be a loving approach that you actually connect your children to Allah rather than yourself. Biologically, they're yours, but the deen is Allah's. You just connect them to Allah. Then you don't have to worry whether you're watching them or not. Then they'll come home and tell you, this is what happened. Okay, the second point for that is communication is ultimately the most important. Thing. Communication with your children. There has to be open communication. What does that mean? They should be able to come home and with at least one of the parents speak about anything. Anything. No subject is taboo. Okay, maybe it's possible that the, both the father and mother can't be that open. Right? They can be that, but at least one of them has to be, if not both. They should be able to come home and discuss with you LGBTQ issues, gender fluidity, because this stuff is being to- talked about in school. So if you can't talk about it at home, then where are they supposed to? Maktab? It can be. But what happens if the maktab isn't geared up to do that? We can complain all I want, all we want, that teacher didn't teach him, but ultimately as a father, I'm going to be asked by Allah, it's my responsibility to either teach directly or to arrange for that teaching. You have to remember that. Me and you as fathers and mothers, it's our responsibility. The buck stops with us, as they say. Very important. That's why the communication needs to be very, very open. We know then what's going on in the child's mind, that they should be able to come home. There's one guy, he's about 30 now, I think. He's married now, 30, no children. He still complains, he's complaining that my house, we've never had a meal together. What do you mean you've never had a meal together? My mom will cook a big pot of food and everybody will come and take, uh, you know, ladle out their portion whenever they want to eat themselves. Why are we making house, our homes into hotels and restaurants? A lot of people, their homes are just hotels and restaurants. That's where the father literally comes in to sleep from his hours and hours on Uber. 
and then going out to shisha cafes or with his friends or watching football and they just come home to sleep and eat. So they have to pay for it somewhere else. So it's a hotel and a restaurant. It's bed and breakfast. Or bed and uh, supper as well, I guess. Right? For a lot of the children is that because there's no communication. I know one kid who um, went to university. right? So in the daytime he's at university. In the evening he's in alim class. In the weekend he's driving trains. He's got no time. He's busy all the time. So you can even feel sorry for him, like, Charlie, he's got no time. But those were the youthful years where you make it or break it. You prepare yourself. You got your degree. You got your alim class. You got your money and you're working. You're running your life, you're, you know. But now, all of that investment has benefited him because now he can do whatever he wants. The rest of the life is there to enjoy anyway. Because you've built your basis. Every moment of your youth is very, very valuable. So, keeping children busy is after, after teaching them who Allah is and connecting them to Allah for accountability and love, right? The only second, the, the second point is keep them busy. There has to be something that our children are doing at all times and we need to be part of that. The problem right now is that we give them a gadget which is the cheapest form. I mean, an iPad costs, what, two, th 300 pounds maybe? But what a cheap way to babysit them. You know, even a babysitter would get tired, but an iPad never gets tired. It just runs out of batteries. So you just have to plug it back in. Otherwise, iPad is the best babysitter. Have you got a babysitter, Hamza? An iPad. Have you got an iPad? Yeah, you got, you got a babysitter as well. Because you know when you're on the iPad, does your mom have to tell you off or anything? Because you're just like so glued to it, right? You, 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 nothing, nothing matters in the world if there are bombs falling around you, no problem, right? You're just so into the game, right? It's so powerful, isn't it? MashaAllah. So it's become very cheap to do that. Before you could close the door of your house to make sure that they don't interact with any, uh, with any strangers, but now you can't even stop that anymore. And there's very few, few families that can get away with no social media in the house. That's like the most difficult thing. Right? You'd have to be really super strategizing to do other things which they enjoy doing than, than to get on the other ways because everybody else does it at school. So open communication in the house is very, very important. God consciousness is very important and um, being busy in the right things, whether it's dunyawi or ukhrawi, has to be both, meaning uh, related to this world and the hereafter needs to be a bit of both so that they understand how to, how to run their life. Our children, um, what's important is that, you know, we're not talking about younger teens. We're probably talking about higher teens or in between the two. It's very important that we teach them some real life skills. Okay, so now let me share uh, with, with you something else that was absolutely terrifying for me when I heard it. Just a few days ago, there's a, uh, a female um, alima. She's teaching... a a group of girls, uh, Ali Marcos. And a discussion began, and the majority of the girls in that class said, we don't want to get married. They're between 17 to 20, 21, 22. They don't want to get married. Okay, why don't you want to get married? This is interesting. Why don't you want to get married? We don't trust men. Okay, how do you guys feel, by the way? We don't trust men. What do you mean you don't trust men? What's wrong with men? They're all liars. Are you guys all liars? Like, are we all liars? Right. But I don't know, women are thinking that all men are liars. Now, I know that that doesn't necessarily represent everyone in the world, but that's a decent cross-section, you know, of uh, maybe 10, 15 girls who majority of them don't want to get married. And somebody else... Uh, in one area has told me that within five or six houses around him, there are at least three women there, three girls, three women, over the age of 40 and they're not yet married. This is a big issue. If you have unmarried men or women, then there's big fitna in the community. There's a lot of zina in area because you know you have needs. People have needs. So needs have to be fulfilled through marriage. And they're not getting married, 40 years old. What else are you gonna do? 
So now the question is, so as uh, she's telling me this, I'm like, but why? He said, all men are like that. I would never, one of them said, I would never marry a, a guy who's on social media. Why is she labeling everybody on social media as bad? Because there's probably, that's what, that's what she's seen, all of the bad stuff going on social media. Do you have social media? Yes, I do, she said, but I'm going to get off it right now. They've understood the horrors of social media, okay? And they don't want to get married with anybody who's on social media. They don't trust anybody. Now, when I was listening to this, I said, but look, hold on. Okay, they might have uh, thought of that in terms of uh, the, 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 the guys they've seen maybe in their school or class or whatever in their extended. But isn't there a role model at home that can counterbalance and say, no, there are decent men in the house. They didn't have their, don't they have a decent father or a brother? No, they don't. She said, I, uh, I was talking to them and one of them said that my father has been beating up my mum since the last 20 something years. That's a wonderful role model. No wonder she hates men, because that's what she's looking at. Okay, look, there is, feminism is a contributor to women hating men, that's there. But that's not all, that, that's not the whole picture though. Yes, there's extreme feminism that is basically getting women to feel that, you know, you are sufficient by yourself, you don't really need men, and so on and so on. That is there. But this stuff doesn't, this stuff is worse, because... Anybody can tell you what's outside, but if you've got a brother, if a girl, right, we have sisters listening, if you have a brother or a father and you would love that your husband would be like them, they're a role model, then that's wonderful. They can counteract all the evil they're looking at outside. But if inside the house, it's the same thing, then men must be messed up, even though they're not. Can you see how important the parental responsibility is? If we can't bring our sons and daughters up, to understand what true manhood and femininity is. And they're learning that from outside and they've got nothing to correct the narrative inside the house, then we have failed. And then it gets worse. Somebody who was listening to this said, this makes a lot of sense. He said that recently in the community, there was a girl who's confused about her gender or actually wants to become a boy. She wants to go through the transformation and become a boy. So somebody spoke to her and she's confused, thinking she wants to do that. She's contemplating the idea. So somebody asked her, why do you want to do that for? Why, why, do, you want to, why do you want to be a boy for? Look at the answer. She said, because you know my brother, he gets much better treatment in the house than I do. How bad must the, her treatment be? And how good must her brother's treatment be that she actually wants to become a boy because she sees that as an option, then maybe my parents will treat me better. I was absolutely taken aback and gobsmacked by this thing. And I was like, look, I need to find out more about this because I usually don't take things at face value because people can say all sorts of things. So I, I prodded further and I asked other people. And what I realized after listening to them is that Allahu Akbar. There's a lot of favoritism and discrimination against girls in our community, in our families. What, what does that mean? Some of, it is, uh, I mean, some of it is not justified in that sense, but the goal is correct. But the, the way they're doing it is wrong. In the sense that, of course, I mean, it's correct that to say that uh, boys are going to have to do work outside. So you understand that they have to be outside sometimes and girls we're more protective over because they're more vulnerable and so on. But this is beyond that. Nowadays, girls are studying at university. And in fact, there's probably more girls. I haven't taken a proper statistic, but from what I've seen uh, uh, while going to universities to, uh, to speak, the, those who are studying is usually two thirds are girls and one third are boys. There's usually more girls. Or at least it's half and half, or usually there's more, more girls, right, studying. Now, I'm not here to say whether that's right or wrong. That's not the point. The point is, is that's what's happening. So you've got a son and daughter, or sons and daughters, they're all studying. When it comes to exam time, um, who's going to do the work in the house? The girl still has to do the work in the house. I'm not saying that's wrong, but the boy is like, no, leave him alone. He's got exams tomorrow. We've got 17, 18-year-old kids who the mother is still making their bed. Boys, whose mothers are still making their beds. They, and they want to rule the world. They want to be the biggest gangster or the biggest uh, businessman or whatever. He's got big ideas. He doesn't know how to make his bed. 
If his mum and sisters were sick for three days, he won't know what to eat in the house. He'd have to eat out because he can't cook himself up even a, an egg. He can't make anything. It's everything his mum or sister has to do for him. That's not right. While, um, you know, I get a bit cheesed off when I see girls marriageable age and all they can boast about is that I'm really, I really enjoy baking. Tell me, can you cook biryani and dal chawal and kari kichri if you're Gujarati, for example? Like, can you cook food except like just a basic pasta dish and then, mashallah, 15 types of baking products? I mean, I like baking products. I like baking, but come on, is that what it is? I'm, I ran into, uh, uh, I, I spoke to one sister, one girl, who has two friends who had just got married. And this girl is now saying that, I don't need to learn how to cook. I said, why not? I said, because one of my friends, she's got married. Her mother-in-law does it all. Right? Allah bless her. Right? Um, and the other one, her husband cooks. He likes cooking. I said, what chances is there that you're going to get a mother-in-law as well who's just going to cook for you and let you relax and take long soaks in the shower or in the bath, right? Or that you're going to find a husband who's a gourmet chef. This is just, this is an, 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 an anomaly. It's not usual. Because these brothers are going to tell what does an anomaly mean? So I tell them, you need to cook. You need to learn how to cook. That's the response. But our guys, what about our guys? I mean, does anybody ever tell our guys to do anything? Our youth. They need to know a lot of things. They don't know how to welcome a guest in the house. If the father or mother isn't there and the guy opens the door, he doesn't know what to say to the, you know, what to say to the visitor. Like, Assalamu alaikum uncle, how are you? Are you okay? Uh, sorry, my parents aren't here, but is there anything I can help you with? You know, I can, I can let them know. None of that is like, no, oh, what is it? What is it? He's like, doesn't know what he's talking about, right? He doesn't know how to pay a bill. He is using the mobile phone, but his mum pays it or his dad pays it. He doesn't know how to pay a bill. If there's an issue on there, he doesn't know how to call him up and, you know, if there's been an overcharge or some other problem, he doesn't know how to do that. He doesn't know how to fix a plug. He doesn't know how to tighten a screw of something if something is leaking. But he wants to be the big guy outside. Sorry, I'm not talking about you. you understand? I'm just saying in general, this is how people are, right? What do you think? Except some really specific people. The, this is skills. When are they going to learn this? Just because the age of ad, uh, being adult in this country is 18, right? That doesn't mean that you don't become an adult sooner. When you're balid, I remember when uh, our Hazrat Mawla Yusuf Mutala Sahib, Rahimahullah, in Darlum, he said one day that if you are mature, you know, if you're 13, 14 years old, your parents, you can't demand from your parents any money. If they give you, take it, but you can't demand any, any extra money. Since that day, I've never asked my parents for money. They all gave me money, but I never asked. I became self-sufficient. I appreciate every time they give me money, alhamdulillah, my, Allah bless him, my father. But what I'm saying is that you have to stand on your own feet. You have to learn chivalry, braveness, dignity. You're supposed to run the world. You're supposed to look after your family. God has made you qawwamuna ala nisa. God has made you responsible for women. For your wives, for your mother when your father dies, for example, if your mother's still around, for your sisters if they need help. Men are responsible. Have we ever told our children that? Like, you're going to be responsible? Like, told them that? If we don't tell them this, then they don't know what role they have to play. Then the society molds the role that they have to play. We have to teach our children this. So, uh, uh, to, uh, to summarize again, the consciousness of Allah from a young age. How do we teach them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah has to become natural in the house. So for example, every time you have a nice meal, and how often do you have a nice meal? How often is that, you know, you enjoy your meal? I'm not talking about like going out to you, I don't mean that. I mean just, you know, you enjoy your food, like you thankful and grateful for the food that you got. I mean, I do it about five times a week, I would say, right? I enjoy my, you know, like the food was very nice. It could be basic dar chawal. Or biryani, but you know, or, or dal, it doesn't matter. But it was just nice, it was fulfilling. I don't mean like going out and having two mixed grills or something. I don't mean that. Right. So you get some new fruit. The food has come out very well. Alhamdulillah. You don't say anything to the children. You just say, Alhamdulillah, look what Allah has given us. And the people in Gaza can't even eat. Or anywhere else, Syria, all of these places where they were struggling. You just thank Allah for every time you're at the meal. 
Like, we need to say Bismillah, we need to say Alhamdulillah. Our children will learn that from us, rather than us having to tell them, read the dua. This needs to be organic. In the sense that it needs to be natural. They just pick it up. For example, with my children when they were young, from when they were young, every time they would have a little pain, the first thing we would do is read something. Bismillah, ladhi la yadurru ma'asmihi, kulhu Allah, wa kulhu Allah, wa kulhu Allah, wa kulhu Allah, and blow on them. And more than 50% of the time it gets better. Call that placebo effect. Or god effect, or whatever you want to call it. It works. When they get old enough, we teach the du'as to themselves. And they do it. Most of the time it's fine. If we're taking medicine, then you tell them to make the du'a as well and take the medicine. They just, you just get them associated with Allah. Your job is easier. But for that, you can't get them associated with Allah when you don't know anything about Allah. If we don't know and we're not connected to Allah, we can't force them to do it. We're going to have to change to make them change. That's very, very important. We're going to have to change to make them change. Then everything is going to come right. So look, I, I don't want to take too much time because I did, we did discuss with uh, Maulana Saab that we are going to have question and answers, right? Because what I speak about may be completely irrelevant. So these were some basic general points that I wanted to share with you. Now we'll open it up to questions so that um, we can talk about anything that's specifically relevant to you. So please feel free to literally ask any question that you want. You can write it down if you're embarrassed to ask openly, right? If I don't know the answer, we'll say so, right? But uh, at least then we can hash out some. Because our community, b getting families corrected means the community can be, become better. Communities are made up of families. And we've got a lot of problems. There are a lot of people into drugs. Why do people get into drugs? Leicester's got a pandemic, just as other areas, of guys in drugs. Whether that's Gujarati, Somali, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, make no difference. I've spoken to a number of people. Why does somebody get into drugs? There's multiple reasons for that. I'm not here to discuss that right now, but there's multiple reasons. And one of them is no God consciousness. They're not, they've got a time on their hands. Number three, they're not connected to their parents so that their parents know what they're doing and they feel comfortable at home. They'd rather be outside with a friend. And parents don't know who their friends are a lot of the time. That opportunity should not even arise. And it's absolutely possible. And your answer is not just sending them to a Muslim school. See, Muslim school kids as well get messed up. I'm not blaming Muslim schools, but I'm saying that's not enough. And I've seen people who've gone to regular state schools and they're completely fine. This is not to put down where Muslim schools are very important. That should be your first choice if you can. But I'm saying that our parents' response is much bigger than that. Uh, is how do we make children connected to Salah? I encourage daily, but find especially pleasure. Even in the winter, I struggle as they don't wake up on time. So now, um, Salat, as I said, and I'm telling you this from experience, is that if we, uh, the secret of getting our, uh, our children to pray by themselves, and Fajr will be difficult. It's difficult for adults sometimes. So understand that that's not easy for everybody except some special wali of Allah, right, who just wakes up, you know, that... Uh, waking of Fajr is not easy for a lot of people, right? However, for Salat in general, to get our children to be good Salat performers, we have to give them the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they're praying for Allah, then they will get up, <coughs> rather than praying for us. So if they, we, uh, how do I judge they're praying for me, and if they're praying for Allah? Sometimes if you're not there, do they, pray their, do they perform their prayer by themselves? That's the best way to judge. If you're not there, for example, and they're with others, and they still pray, they've got that consciousness, whether they pray late or early, but they pray, that means they're praying for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they're praying, if we're not there and they're not praying, they're praying for us, we need to change that, otherwise there's no way to do this. Yes, in the beginning it's okay. Eventually, ultimately, within one or two years, they need to pray for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we get them to pray for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then? Not just by telling them, pray, pray. Uh, once uh, there was a kid in our madrasa, he, he was from a very liberal family, which other, and uh, he wouldn't come for Jumu'ah. I, I, th I know he wanted to, right? But I don't think he had the full understanding of why, because his father was not taking it seriously or whatever. Got fadail a'mal, 
you know, beautiful Fadail A'mal and the chapter on Salat in there, about the benefits of Salat, the virtues of Salat, and the punishments of not praying Salat. He was there next Jummah. He has now understood that he's doing it for a reason. So, our brothers here, do you know why we pray Salat? Right? Do you know why you should make namaz? Why should you make namaz? One of you want to answer me? Yes. Because it's the fast and you will be questioned. Right. So that's a fear factor. It's good enough, but that's based on fear factor. I don't want to be punished. Jalo, it, it works. If it works, it works. Right? Are, you, are you worried that you're going to be punished in the hereafter if you don't pray? Because they're going, Allah's going to ask you about it? Yeah. So he, he's doing it for fear factor, which is okay to start with. But ultimately, it needs to be done for the sake of Allah's love. The fear factor, or the, that, that's just to start. Or that you're going to get paradise because of it, that's just the starting point. Once you go beyond that, those things should not even be... It's not, you shouldn't be worried about that. You're more about, I need, I'm a slave of Allah. I, I owe it to Allah. So I'll tell you why we pray. Have you got a color? Have you got an auntie that gives you a lot of stuff and she's always like, really looks after you when you go to a house? Have you got an auntie like that, a color like that or something? Everybody does, right? Yeah. Now when you go to a house, imagine you ignored her. When you went into the house, she was there waiting for you to give her a hug or whatever. And you didn't even say salam to her. You completely ignored her. You went to your cousin's room and started playing with the PlayStation or whatever it is. Would she be happy with you? Would she still be nice to you? Probably, but she'll feel bad, right? So what, should we do that though? No, right? So we give examples like that. This example is very powerful for children. Right, that Allah has given us everything. You know, all of your clothing, your beautiful parents, everything that you have, Allah has given it to you. Did you ask Him for it? He just gave it to you. He is so kind. And all He wants from us is that we remember Him five times a day. In our, and the way we remember Him is in our namaz. That's why we pray. Not because He's going to beat us up in the hereafter. Right? Not because, you know... We have to pray because we just have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He just wants that. That's all He wants from us. Do you understand? If we don't have these practical ways of explaining, it's not going to work. Then they're going to do it for some other reason. I mean, at least He's doing it for a fear factor, but some, uh, like, because my dad wants me to pray or because my mom shouts at me. But again, fajr is difficult. But the way to find out whether who they're doing it, just see if they pray when you're not around. When you're not there, tell them. And then focus on that. Number two, very powerful. Read this dua. Um, if somebody can find me the reference. Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as-salati wa min dhurriyyati rabbana wa taqabbal dua. Believe me, this is a miracle dua. Rabbi, I know somebody who says that when they were young, and they are a hafiz and alim as well, and they had uh, religious parents, and they were quite particular about prayer, but he said, I messed up on so many prayers. Right, I messed up and so on. But he says, my children are much better than I was. That since they've become balik, they've never missed a single prayer. Or if they have, they've done qada. And I'm, he says, I'm not more stricter than my parents were. I'm actually less strict than my parents were about salat. But because they have God consciousness, and he said, the second reason is, رَبِّ جَعَلْنِي مُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِن ذُرِّيَّةِ رَبَّنَا وَتَقَبَّلْ دُعَا our Lord, make me from of those who establish the prayer and from my progeny. Progeny and Allah's du'as are amazing, right? Not just my children, but my progeny until the day of judgment. So I'm making du'a for everybody to come from me, even after I've gone. I'm making that du'a. And have that in your mind as well. Very powerful du'a. Those two things. First, find out why they're doing it. And, uh, uh, explain to them why they must pray. Use fadail amal if you have to. Use some other psychology, philosophy, explanation. And then, and then get them going on that. And inshallah, they'll pick that up. Surah Ibrahim, verse 40. Ch uh, keep that in mind. Go and learn the dua. And in every one of your, after every one of your prayers, keep making that dua. And for the sister who asked this question, that dua, you should make a word of it. Verse 40 of Surah Ibrahim. It is Ibrahim Islam's dua anyway. Yeah. Yes, brother. Okay. I'm glad you brought that question up. There's only so much we can cover in a talk, but I'm glad you're bringing up the relevance. So this is a very important question. You know that one in four, every four uh, teenage girls, it's worse in girls than boys. There's a problem in boys as well. Uh, it's in the BBC everywhere. You can find this online, right? Mental health problems in teen girls. One in four teen girls 
That means 25% of girls, and this was a few years ago, it might have been worse, have a mental health problem. Have a psychological problem. Right? What do we do about that? Or why does it come about? Number one, it's because of the society, what they demand of girls is crazy. The society demands of girls that you must look amazing. You must smell amazing. You must, your hair must be amazing. Your nails must be amazing. Your skin tone and color and luster must be amazing. And you need to look like this particular model that has been airbrushed using software better than, better than nature. So they get the best models, the, 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 the most flawless models. They take pictures of them with the right light conditions and everything. Then they go into Photoshop or other software and they remove any other natural blemishes. So what they show you on the screen or in advertisements is not real. That's not how they look in real life. That is not how they look in real life. But you must look like them. And you can't, so you're depressed. When you're trying to be like something that you cannot be like, that your hair is flawless and, it, and your smell is flawless and your color is flawless, and it's just crazy. How do you live up to that expectation? It's a multi-billion dollar industry. That's what that is. It just wants your money. So you can't be like that, so you get depressed because you think you must be in is a competition. Snapchat. Do you know that we're living in a time when in history, throughout human history, prehistoric age until now, no, uh, we are the most people with the greatest vanity. Because in history, how, in history, nobody has ever looked at themselves so many times a day as we do today. Literally, just think about it. If you wanted to look at yourself, before there weren't any mirrors, you'd have to probably go to a lakeside or get a bowl of water and look in there. All right? You're not going to carry a bowl of water with you to get your reflection, are you? Because there were no... There were pro then after that, they found polished steel, po polished uh, silver, whatever it was, or polished metal. And now, it's on your phone, so you can just keep checking what you look like. It's just ridiculous. It's not natural. This is, humans aren't supposed to be looking at them this many times a day. <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous. It's just, it's just crazy. So the vanity that's there. Okay, that, that's some uh, social issues. Number three. The absent father syndrome or the missing father syndrome, that has a massive impact on girls. It's re yeah, the, the studies are quite crazy on this. You know that? They say that if there is no father in the picture, it doesn't mean that uh, there is no father at all. It could be that, or it's just a missing father, or hardly available father. The girls will biologically start menstruating quicker than, than uh, girls who do have a father figure. That's number one. Number two, girls are groomed much more easily when they've not had a father figure. Why? Because every human being, boys and girls, require attention from mother and father, that's the natural system of the world. That's why some of the modern ideas of having two mothers or two fathers doesn't really work, it's lopsided in that sense. Like genuinely, because you need both, right? Mother gives a certain, uh, imparts a certain type of uh, tarbiyah and training and reassurance uh, and characteristic while the father does uh, their side of the thing. If the father is not around, he's working too much or he's with his friends after work or he's just not involved. Girls need that. They've been deprived of it. So some Tom and Dick and Harry outside who's going to tell her, you look really nice, she's just going to get caught up with that. So they're more prone to grooming and indoctrination. And biologically, they menstruate quicker. It's something weird phenomena we have. And then they have all of these other mental health problems because uh, in addition, maybe they're being discriminated discriminated against because of their brothers. Bring up your children in such a way that your son can see his sister and say, I wish I had somebody so decent like that as my wife. And your, the, the girl can say, MashaAllah, you know, I wish I can get somebody like my father or my brother 
like to be my husband. That's the kind of husband I want. That's a role model. So this is the reason for the mental health. And the biggest problem is nobody's recognizing that. They know when they get into drugs, but they don't understand they've got mental health problems, why they're slashing their wrists, why they don't want to believe, why, they want to, uh, uh, why they're confused about their gender, and so on. This is all uh, to do with the mental health problem. And I have seen some movement in this regard that there are some brothers, even in Leicester, that are trying to take care of that, but there's not enough. It's a, that is an endemic, as you say. Right? So we have to consider that. And if we've got troubled girls and boys in our family, then that's our responsibility. Get help. Don't feel bad about it. You'd rather go and get help. The problem is when we're in these close-knit societies, is Leicester a village, by the way, or is it? It's a city. But is it a gam? That's what I mean. Huh? Not this place. This is uh, Surat, is it? Oh, it's farms. Okay. What I mean by that is I've had so many questions. Somebody calling from another town outside London about an issue. I said, you know, you've got local scholars, talk to them. He said, no, I, I don't want anybody to know. Right? I don't want anybody to know. So I said, that's fine, but you know, physically I can't help you because I'm not close enough to you. You need to go to a local alim. Right? Obviously, local alim need to uh, maintain confidentiality. But number two, what you have to really be worried about is that if you don't get help sooner, it's going to get out of hand. If you're worried about everybody finding out, eventually they're going to find out when it gets too bad anyway. So get help sooner, please, brothers. Get help sooner than later. Hopefully I've given you enough to actually just judge where we are with this. And if you've got problems, then get help, inshallah. Okay, next question. This is one from the sisters. How can you change the attitude problem in a child? How can you open up a child to speak to you about his feelings? Look, there are some boys and girls who are closed books. They're the, most, they're the toughest people you can deal with. If your child doesn't speak to you, then Allah Ta'ala help because that's very... Then the problem with them is you only find out when things have gone so bad that it's gone beyond. Like in the last two years, I would say, one and a half, two years, dealt with at least three 16, 17-year-olds that have literally left their faith, though they're from practicing families because um, they were, they, they're very quiet. They're not outgoing girls. They're usually girls, but sometimes boys as well. They're not outgoing. They're very closed books. They're just on their own device or something. Right? And you don't know because they're very secretive, they don't speak. So what do you do about that? What you do about that is you do make a lot of dua, that's for sure. But number two, you try to find a way in. Change your attitude, change your style so that they might trust you. And if you can't do that, because you can't wait to do that, right? Find somebody they speak to. Get them on your side and get them like a cousin, an older brother, sister, an uncle, an auntie. And get through to them, what are they thinking? Especially if you see troubling signs. You need to do this sooner or later and do a lot of dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise it's very difficult to coax them to speak to you. Maybe change your style so they actually feel like you're going to be different. Alright? They have to use strategy. There was, a, there was a girl who, you know, became a bit rebellious. So if you told her to buy this, she want to buy that. Just to, uh, just to spite the parents. I think the parents kind of woke up and got strategic. If they wanted her to buy this dress instead of that one, they would actually say, no, buy that one instead. So just to be rebellious, she'd gone buy the other one, which there's, you just have to use strategy. By the way, I'll tell you something else. There is no science behind bringing up children. Do you know that? The scientists uh, or researchers in this field, they've pretty much conclusion is that there is no one scientific method of <coughs> successfully bringing up your children. However, in, they're obviously not looking at Islamic guidelines, right? The Islamic guidelines, which are not specific guidelines that do this exactly, aside from specific ones like give them a good name and, you know, at this age separate them in the bed and make namaz and all of that. They're broad guidelines and we need to understand them and the behavior. Then inshallah we can be successful. But yeah, that, that's, that's a tough one. But use these strategies. Ask somebody else to speak to them. Maybe write to your child. They might be more comfortable in writing back to you. They're living in the same house. <coughs> but you know that whenever you speak, they, they don't say anything. So write a really nice motherly, fatherly letter that shows you to be very open. And say, look, give me an answer. Two days, five days, give me an answer. I really want to hear from you. Try that. How do you inspire our children with the love of Allah as messengers of Islam? 
I think I answered that short, uh, briefly already, which is that Allah needs to become part of the house, part of your life, part of your home. Allah needs to be mentioned over and over again, organically by ourselves, then it will become theirs. So let's just say that something really good for us. You know, Alhamdulillah, all praises to Allah. Like literally say that in whatever language, Allah has given us this. Allah is so graceful to us. Just look how much Allah keeps giving us. Like say it genuinely. They'll pick that up. Allah has to become part of our life, vocally, openly. And then, oh, we have to pray. We can't, um, we can't be ungrateful to Allah. Don't make salah, like, hey, we have to pray, we're going to get beaten up. No. We can't be ungrateful to Allah. Let's stop over at this cafe, at this service station. Let's pray. You know, we have to pray for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the minimum we can do. Make it very organic, like make it simple. That's what we do this for the sake of it's part of our life. That's the way to teach them. And then number two, there's other things. Um, I'll just quickly go, I don't have time, but I've got lectures. You can go on Zamzam Academy uh, channel and there's a number of other lectures where I deal with this in a bit more detail. But number one, if you want to know Allah, you have to start reading the Quran with meaning. So aside from your normal reading that you do of the Qur'an, if you do that already, alhamdulillah, then at least read one or two pages a day and just reflect over what Allah is saying. And Allah, we get to know Allah better. If we don't know Allah, that's why we can't transfer the love of Allah or the consciousness of Allah to our children. That's number one. Number two, go through the 99 names. Get a translation of the 99 names of Allah and adopt a few that are re relevant to you at that particular time. You'll be amazed. Allah is a very multifaceted uh, entity. So, for example, if you've got something complicated going on in life, you'll find the name Ya Latif. Start using that. I'll give you an example. Um, I did a really beautiful illuminated copy of this beautiful dua book called Al Hizbul A'zam several years ago, and people were asking for a translation. So I worked on a translation and got it ready in 2021, which is two years ago, but then I didn't publish it because I'm, I fuss too much, right? in terms of the design, so I couldn't settle on a design. I had other work to do as well, so it wasn't like I was working on it you know, full time. And then I thought, you know what, the translation is 100% ready and I'm wasting it now. Like, you know, people need to benefit from it. So after this last Ramadan, I said, I, I need the right design. I just couldn't come up with the right design. You know, you have a designer block. So I said, what name of Allah can I use? <coughs> So I came up with one name. Anybody know which name of Allah I can use for design? <coughs> MashaAllah, Jazakallah. So actually, there was Ya Musawwir, O Fashioner, O person who provides the best design and the best form. There's also another name. Al Bari, Al -Bari is more like an innovator. It, it, it works, but there was another one I, I thought was even more closer. Jamil. Inna Allah Jamilun Yuhibbul Jamal. Allah is elegant and beautiful and He loves beauty and elegance. Allahu Akbar. Believe me, I did dua with the name of Allah and five minutes I had a design ready that I was satisfied with. Allah is there to give you because He wants Himself to be known. So think of that, the names of Allah. Number three, have some kind of dhikr regimen. And number four, have some kind of association with people who do know Allah. And that's when you learn about Allah yourself. If we can learn about Allah, our home will be the place of Allah. There's a study that there was a PhD thesis that was written uh, quite a few years ago. How to bring Allah into teaching for teachers. And literally what she suggests in there is that every 10 minutes you mention Allah in some way or the other. You know, uh, wow, God has created it so wonderfully. God protects us. Allah protects us. You know, or whatever, you bring it in organically somewhere. Allah has to be brought up over and over again for other people around us, for, it, uh, for, for them to take it on, inshallah. The Muratab says men are responsible. Does this mean emotionally as well as physically? What if the man finds it hard to emotions be supportive? It affects the marriage and kids. Is emotional intelligence a prerequisite for a good marriage? Many women are struggling with this, where men don't provide, don't provide emotional support and sit on their phones and not want to be an active member of the home. How does one navigate such a situation? That's a very, very tough question. You can read my book on marriage. But that's a very tough question because usually the wife is the one who's complaining and she's the one who's suffering. I can tell her what I want, but the husband's not listening. 
So what's the point of that? If you understand, the husband has to hear. So the practical suggestions I've got is they're not easy. There's dua, Rabbana, the, the second dua after the other one I said, Surah Ibrahim verse 40. This one is Surah Al-Furqan verse 75. Okay, Surah Al-Furqan verse 75 for beautiful um, joy, joy creating uh, children, progeny and spouses. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata ayin wa ja'alna al-muttaqeen ayin How do you get the husband to be involved? I don't know. It's a tough one. However, I can give a few suggestions. Number one, try to speak to him. But a lot of the time there'll be such a distrust that they won't, they won't trust you. That nothing, nothing that comes from you is valid. right? It's that bad. Get somebody else to speak to him. Get him to listen to a lecture where this is mentioned. They might change for a few days then they'll go back to normal. This is the problem. Okay? I'm just, I'm just being honest. This is, this is what the problem is. Right? Uh, n- number four, you got a tough job. I, I, I wish I can give you more. It's just a tough job. Somebody has to get through to this husband that he needs to take part. Some husbands don't know how to do it. They just emotionally don't know. Now look, there is this thing, right? Which I haven't understood yet. Sometimes you're told that the father needs to be a friend with his children. I don't know how to be a friend and I don't know how you can be a friend with your children. You're a father at the end of the day. But be a father at least. Do you understand? You don't have to be a friend because you're not a friend. You can be friendly with them and play with them and joke with them. That all needs to be there. But you are the father ultimately. Okay? You can't be emotionally detached. There are some men, they're just on their phones watching football or on their phone doing something else. Or they're out somewhere else and they just not, they think their wife does all of that. I just need to bring some money in and pay for the food and everything else. That is completely wrong. So if you are a man like that, then I'm talking to you. But if you're not here, which is the problem, they don't even listen to lectures. That's the problem. They don't even come for Jumu'ah. A lot of these guys, they come for the Arabic part of the khutbah. So they never learn anything new. They're just... I don't know. They don't learn anything new. You know, the only time that anybody, uh, that such people learn anything is when there's a nikah gathering where they have to go for the actual nikah. Because even in Jumu'ah, they come for the Arabic khutbah, they don't understand Arabic, they don't listen to the bayan. They, since they've been in maktab, they've not, not learned anything new. Since maktab, they've never learned anything new about Islam. If they picked up a few things, if they've been forced to sit in a bayan, something like, buzurg agaya, right? And they've had to listen to a few things. They've never, they don't, their life, their Islam has not evolved. And then their kids get messed up and they don't know why. You can see my frustration. And there's some men and women, by the way. It's not just always men, by the way. It's just that women are usually more connected to the children. That's why, right? They are right all the time. They're always right. So you get a call, my husband or my wife, but usually it's the husband. Uh, he's like this. I said, okay, that's fine. Tell your father to speak to him. No, he doesn't listen to my father. He doesn't talk to my father, actually. Okay, tell his father. No, he doesn't listen to his father. I said, okay, talk to the Mawlana in the masjid. He didn't talk to the Mawlana in the masjid. He, didn't talk to, he doesn't agree with anybody. He's just right all the time. So I want to ask, I've been actually looking for a guy like this. Because I keep being told like that about people, but I've never found somebody who's never made a mistake in his life. He's always right. Do we have somebody here who's always right in everything? Please, please. I've been looking for a long time. Somebody who's always right. There must be somebody in Leicester, man. You haven't produced somebody who's always right? <laughs> Just remember, we can never always be right. Only the Prophet ﷺ is always right and Allah. Yes, if we're experienced, like we're, it's our occupation, then we'll be more right most of the time, right? But we can always be wrong. But anybody who thinks they're always right and their wife doesn't know what she's talking about and she's some idiot, right? Your life is going to be miserable. You might be enjoying your life alone, Right? And celebrating by yourself when, when everything goes your way. But believe me, one day it's all going to blow up. I'll tell you why. In the last one and a half years, I've had three or four women call me who are, who are now in marriage over 20 years. So they have children who are over 20. And finally, finally it's come to a head. They've been literally suffering for 20 years. 
but they didn't do anything because of the children. It's been sabr, sabr. Now he's getting midlife crisis is over. It, it, it's going crazy. You can't always be right. You can't always be right. And women are not all dumb. They're not all stupid. They have qualities. And I'm not saying this to big up women. Okay? Women have their own feminine quality. They're very different from males. But the children need both of those things. If you haven't been able to recognize the femininity of a woman, because some women don't recognize it. They use hard power instead of soft power. Women should use soft power rather than hard power. That makes them more feminine and more, ag- more, more attractive. And I'm not, I don't want to blame men only in this. The woman could be doing something wrong, but we're not here to deal with that issue today. right? But, but uh, yeah, really look, you owe it to your children. You might pass 20 years, and then after that there's going to be a divorce. Or you're not going to be speaking. Get help sooner than later. If things aren't going right, there's a woman, she calls me, about seven, eight years ago. She's got problems with her husband over something in the house. right? I try to tell her, look, you're going to have to take a step. You're going to have to do something different for things to change because he's used to what you're always doing. If you keep nagging him, he's not going to do anything. You keep crying, it's not going to do anything because it hasn't made a difference until now. Why is it going to make a difference tomorrow? You're doing the same thing over and over again for the last five years or ten years. You haven't done anything. So I tell her, look, you need to do something different. She goes, no, Bobby Klage. I'm really scared to do that. I said, okay, fine. Carry on. She calls me back after one and a half, two years. And it's gotten worse. Now, they're not even sleeping together. And again, I tell her what I... But she's not willing to take a move, make a move. Make it, you know, different. Make a, uh, 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 use a different approach. Then she calls me back again after uh, another one or two years, when it just gets too difficult, and now they're not even sleeping in the same room. It's, mashallah, it's getting better. Is that getting better? But they're not willing to take, make a move. They would have done something and sorted it out, or at least tried to, right? Because, you know, you never divorce. That was the village. I mean, in some cases, the divorce is better. I'm not here to encourage divorce, but in some cases, the divorce is better. Rather than psychological mess up, and the children are bought, bought, uh, brought up lopsided in a family where the husband and wife, where their mother and father are each other's necks all the time. They're psychologically affected children. Is that better? I don't know. I don't think so. So try to sort it out earlier because the more longer you keep it, the deeper down to the ground you get. Then it gets much more difficult to sort it out afterwards. Okay, we'll do shorter answers. We need to. Inshallah, uh, this is from, this, uh, from brothers. What is your advice for parents homeschooling? Homeschooling, mashallah. Homeschooling is a tough job, right? In some cases, it's better than normal schooling, and in some cases, it's worse. So it just depends what your children are like and what you're like. If you've got the patience and your children has the patience, you can make it really exciting, then it's great. Because then you can treat them the way you want to do. However, there's a benefit of being with other children. So what you can do, if you've got a problem with the local schools that is going to be a big fitna or whatever, then you do a cooperative homeschooling, where you get multiple parents together, and then you all take turns. So then there is a variety in the other way. Man, you're a parent. You're the mother. You're the father, maybe. You're the discipliner, and now you're the teacher as well. It's just too difficult. So not all parents. It's not for everybody, by the way. It's not for everyone. It's for some people. And it's for some children. So that's the general answer. You make istikhara and try it out if you want to. right? But to have the, uh, the Islamic school is the best. A good Islamic school is the best. But not all Islamic schools are proper Islamic schools, or nor are they the best. So in that case, sometimes I've seen that a secular school is actually better than the only available Muslim school. It's just got better education and better discipline. Even though it doesn't have a Muslim ethos, it's got better discipline, right? It just all depends, but hands down, first thing, Islamic school is the best. You know, if everything's better in there, right? Homeschooling is not for everyone, but if you can do it, then we've seen a lot of success in that for some people. Can you advise children to combine Dhuhr and Asr in winter times when time is very short? I don't believe in uh, combination. It's not allowed to do unless they're not balik, then just for the sake of making them used to it, maybe it's okay. But I don't agree with that for anybody who's mature to combine. They just have to make the best effort to do it in, uh, you know, in the right time to the best of their ability. 
And I think it is e- easy because Zohar you can do in your lunch break and Asr you can do straight after you finish class somewhere. Again, just talk to a teacher. If there's no prayer room in your school, for example, you speak to a teacher. There must be some decent teacher in your school that will allow uh, you to use uh, the classroom. You just quickly pray there. Use wudu socks so that you can do wudu quickly and then just don't take too long. So our little brother here, he's saying that he's got a friend who's from a Muslim family, but he doesn't even, uh, he doesn't even eat halal food and he doesn't pray and he goes out to, does a bit of drugs as well and uh, goes out to parties and stuff like that. Look, um, I, I don't want to judge his family because we don't know, right? But uh, it looks like he's probably not been given a proper tarbiyah, right? that's for sure, meaning proper training. So you are his best option now. Right? It's as if God has sent you to help him. Now, he's not going to change overnight. Somehow you have to show him that you got a better way without telling him it's the better way. You just have to do things where he realizes the emptiness in his heart is not being filled. Because everybody's got him and what they're doing when they go out to parties and that is that they're just trying to enjoy themselves to fill in the emptiness in the heart. You need to show that you, are, you, know, you do your stuff, you're quite diligent, you're quite, uh, you, know, you enjoy your life as well even though you do your prayers and everything like that. One day he'll come and you just give him a bit of drip drip nasiha, uh, which means advice every now and then. And hopefully one day, like you invite him, like, you know, like this weekend, do you want to come to this program? Right? Just try to casually bring him over slowly, slowly. He's not going to maybe change overnight, but mashallah, you might be his savior to sort him out. Right? So, uh, and make a lot of dua for him when he's not around. You make a lot of dua, Allah Ta'ala, uh, let me, uh, you know. Because if you do, if he does sort out, that's your life has been sorted, mashallah, you'll get so much reward. So maybe take him to a program casually, you know, an enjoyable program or something like that as well. Please advise on mobile phones, giving children who are teenagers phones. What is your advice on this? That is again another, I don't have an answer to it. I wish there were no mobile phones, to be honest. So there's, uh, I can give you a few stories that there's somebody who did not give their daughter a mobile phone until she was 16 and then what happened is that she got one secretly. They found out but they couldn't pin it down and then finally they found it and now the reason she got it is she's saying look all of my friends at school have it. I'm the only one who doesn't. And that's not a nice place to be. Right? That's not a nice place to be that everybody's got something around you and you don't have it. Unless you're like mashallah you've understood the the research behind it, and you don't have it on a principle that I don't, you know, I don't think it's good. But that's very difficult to get through to children, right? So that's number one. You can put, you can delay, delay as far as you can, but then ultimately you can't delay beyond that. Then I know somebody who finally gave their son, son, uh, a phone at sixteen because he was going to a college further away. He needed it and so on, but it's got parental control on it so he actually goes off after a certain time so he can't not goes off but pretty much you can't do much on it after a certain time of the day and he has a certain amount of gigabytes a month uh, maybe five gigabytes a month and one month he used it up so uh, it's like okay what did you use it on it's youtube sitting in the bus so he's been told look we're gonna buy you one gigabyte just so that you know uh, where the buses are and so on but from next month you're, you're gonna have to budget you're going to have to. So I think we have to teach our children. But ultimately, what you have to do is if, you don't, if we teach them Allah's consciousness, then we can mitigate a lot of the harm that, they, that could come to them from the phone. They're still fitna, right? They're still fitna because it's just addictive. So it, they won't listen to you as the parent when you don't want them to do X, Y, and Z on the phone. Because that you're suspicious, right? It, it, you know, you just don't want them to have the phone. You're, you're just cruel. In their eyes, you're just cruel. Right? You just don't want them to have a phone. You're just you boring guys. Don't want your children to have phones. That's what they think. So what you can do is, there's on YouTube and other places, there are this analysis of ha- the harms of these things by third-party people. Sometimes uh, there's discussions by the inventors of these things. Let them watch that. Let them read that. So that it's coming from a more neutral source. So at least it's in their heart. So we know some kids, for example, they, um, at night they were doing their homework and then they got onto YouTube or whatever they got onto and they slept at 2 o'clock at night. So now in the morning, 
He's telling his mom, you know, mom, why didn't you not put my phone off, like put the internet off on there at 11 o'clock? He knows he's got a problem. He does it, just like many of us do as well, spend two hours on YouTube and then we regret it afterwards. Right? So it's a combination of factors. Basically, <coughs> delay it as much as possible and then have some parental guidance on there and then tell them the harms of it. And if they don't listen to you, try it. But other, otherwise, you just keep trying. It, it's just uh, one of those things which are... I don't know, hopefully they pass some law eventually because it's not easy. Yes, brothers, mashallah, you, uh, Allah Ta'ala bless everybody here for sitting for so long. I can't believe we've been sitting for so long, alhamdulillah. Allah Ta'ala accept it and Allah Ta'ala allow the blessing of this gathering uh, to affect our lives and uh, positively benefit our families. Sorry we couldn't answer all the questions. But uh, uh, what do you call it? I've got lectures on a number of these questions on Zamzam Academy channel that you can go to and uh, the rest of them you can come and consult your ulama you know now that the question has come up if you haven't got an answer call them uh, come to the masjid talk to them otherwise uh, I've got a public number on Zamzam Academy you can call me as well inshallah at any decent time inshallah and uh, Allah bless you all Jazakallah khair keep us in your duas <coughs> اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام تبارك يا ذي الجلال والإكرام اللهم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث يا حنان يا منان لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين جزا الله عنا محمد ما هو أهله يا غفار يا فتاح يا ستار يا حفيظ يا سلام يا لطيف يا لطيف يا ذي الجلال والإكرام يا الله have mercy on us and accept us Ya Allah, protect us. Ya Allah, guide us. Oh Allah, you have showered us with so many bounties. Oh Allah, you have given us a lifestyle which is the lifestyle of the top 5 to 7% of the world. Oh Allah, you have given us access to security, to safety. Oh Allah, to various facilities. Oh Allah, we eat the food we want, we wear the clothes we want, we drive what we want. Oh Allah, do not make this a form of mischief for us. Oh Allah, do not make us heedless because of this. Do not make us negligent because of this. Oh Allah, oh Allah, we ask that you uh, allow us to love you and you love us. That you grant us your consciousness, you grant us your taqwa, you grant us your love. And especially among our children, make, them, uh, make us first of those who establish your prayers and who establish prayers for you and exercise devotion fully and then allow them to do it as well. Oh Allah, make them the gladness of our eyes in the right way. And not just our children, but our progenies until the day of judgment. Oh Allah, oh Allah, protect us and them and the entire world from all the fitnas which are out there, all of the challenges which are out there, all the temptations which are out there. O oh Allah, with all the temptations that are out there, O oh Allah, protect us. O oh Allah, grant us an understanding of what the truth is and allow us to follow the truth as it is and allow us to abstain from the wrong. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, keep us and our children away from all of the mischief which is out there, all of the wrong deeds which are out there. O oh Allah, this project of Darul Arqam and O oh Allah, all the other projects, O oh Allah, that are, that are liwajhik, that are for your, uh, for, for your pleasure. O oh Allah, our project in London and O oh Allah, all the other projects, O oh Allah, accept them. O oh Allah, remove the obstacles, remove any hindrances, allow them to, allow them to uh, reach their fruition, allow them to be hugely beneficial and allow them to remain until the day of judgment and O oh Allah bless all of those who contribute who assist in whatever way it is O oh Allah grant them blessing in their life O oh Allah forgive us our wrongdoings and especially those wrongdoings and those sins which bring darknesses in our life which turn people against one another which take the blessing away from our life which make us discontented O oh Allah bring back O oh Allah, oh Allah, we especially seek your forgiveness from those sins that have now become part of our life and we don't even consider them sins anymore. O oh Allah, grant us beneficial knowledge to eradicate these things and become people who really who really love you and who really are the way you want you want them to be. O oh Allah, make us and our children the way you want us to be. O oh Allah, our brothers and sisters in Palestine, especially in Palestine, Gaza, and in the other places, O oh Allah, remove that oppression from them. O oh Allah, remove, relieve them. O oh Allah, grant them their dignity and their honor and their freedom. O oh Allah, grant them their freedom. O oh Allah, we sit here safely and a few fireworks 
uh, we can hear in November and we, we just wonder how it must be for them that not a, n- not a moment is there without some loud sounds and destruction and carnage and they don't know where they have to be the next day. Oh Allah, all of those children who have died in there, all of those ch- children who have been maimed in there, all of those older people and everybody, oh Allah, let your mercy come. Oh Allah, your mercy is already there, but oh Allah, cool our hearts. Oh Allah, allow us to see relief. Allah, allow us to see relief and relief from all of this. Oh Allah, oh Allah, we ask that you allow us to do what's correct, what's productive, and what is right for us to do. Oh Allah, use us for the service of your deen. Use us for the service of your deen. And oh Allah, we pray to you that above us, those who are in charge, those who make the rules, oh Allah, give them insaniya, give them true understanding of what the reality is. Oh Allah, do not let them fall prey to various different interests that are that, that, that are destroying this world. Oh Allah, allow them to be correct in what they're doing and guide them aright. Oh Allah, guide them aright. Oh Allah, guide them aright. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon. Wa salamun al mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil uh, The point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, And that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules. And at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam, and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind. You can continue to to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.